All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Give us a few minutes here. Let some more people show up or whatever. Before we get into debunking the pre-trib problems video again. What's up, Brother Brian? Oh, actually the ceiling right now. Little joke there, but uh, staying busy, that's never a problem. <clears throat> so, I have this screen here up of the uh, uh, my video here on Rumble. This is the video that got taken down, Satan's Favorite Philosophy. And uh, and they took it down off YouTube, and I was suspended for a week. That's why I was not here last weekend. So yeah, this one here. Hello from Nigeria. Hello. Nice to see you here this morning. I don't I think I'm I don't know if I've ever had anybody from Nigeria on one of the live streams, so that's neat. Um if anybody wants to uh just write down, you know, hi from the area where you're from. I can help other people see that there's someone in their area. I've had people connect actually through live streams. Um, so that's great. All right. Sounds good. To put up your comment here, brother. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, I got your email, and I was actually going to talk to you yesterday. Uh, I had we have a wood stove here, and it needed to be repainted because it's rusty. And so I got the paint work done, and I said, okay, I have some time. I'm, I said to my wife, I said I'm going to have to go need to go talk to Jacob real quick here. And she said, yeah, okay, fine. I was walking in the hallway, and poof, the lights went out. <laughs> And they were out for a while, and so I never did get to contact you. But uh, got your email, and I want to talk to you about the thing there you mentioned. So, but uh, things are always uh, crazy. But good morning to everybody. All right, I guess we'll get started here. Um, but like I said, if you want to see this video and see why YouTube took it down, if you haven't seen it, it's about evolution. And it's kind of interesting. I'm reading a book right now um, from the Weston A. Price Foundation on the, it's called Contagion, on the thing that happened uh, here in 2020. You know what I mean? And um, they were talking about how Darwinism, actually was social Darwinism before it became biological slash scientific Darwinism. Social Darwinism is basically the philosophy. Um, and Charles Darwin got a lot of his, you know, like the survival of the fittest and some of those things actually from philosophers. So uh, it was not science. It's never been science. But um, just kind of thought that was interesting that it was actually a social Darwinism um, philosophy thing before it actually became part of you know science so let's get started here on this nutty thing here we're at the uh revelation problem i think did we do the i'm trying to think of where we stopped i think we did up to the second thessalonians problem it was about as far as we got so if i remember correctly um, so I think that's it. Uh, let me just check my video from two weeks ago real quick here. Just, I want to make sure we don't cover the same material. I 
I don't want to put anybody through it if I don't have to. They're kind of fall. Okay. Let me get. Yeah, okay. All right. Sorry about that. I just wanted to check. Okay. Let's get started here. Again, hi to everybody. Good morning. We're going to go now with the revelation problem. We'll see if we can get through this thing. And um, here we go. There are several passages. Okay. Can everybody hear the audio with it? Just to make sure. Did everybody hear the audio when I was playing it? A couple of you could just say yes or no or whatever. Just want to make sure I have it right before we get into it. Okay, good. And yes, we can. So let's uh, let's do that real quick here. We'll pray before we get started. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would be with us all this morning as we go through this video and um, search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And I pray that uh, if there are any out there that are confused on this issue, that they would really pay attention and that they your word would be their final authority. Not my words or the words of the people in this video. And if any of the producers of this video are watching, I pray that they would lower their pride and realize that they were they are in very serious error and very wrong. And uh, we should be looking for you and not for the Antichrist. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. All right. Now let's get started on the Revelation problem. And again, you have to remember these guys don't use the King James Bible, so they're going to be wrong in a lot of areas. In the book of Revelation, supporting the idea that the church will face the Antichrist persecution just before the rapture and that both the rapture and the day of the Lord will not begin until after the midpoint of the seven-year period. This is all, of course, contrary to the traditional pre-trib model. Which okay, again, understand that this, the traditional pre-trib model, this is not the pre-trib model. The day of the Lord begins at the end. The time of Jacob's troubles, what is the seven-year period? So again, they're lying teaches that the rapture will occur before the seven-year period begins. In the book of Revelation, most of the events that take place in the book correspond to various stages of a symbolic scroll being opened. For example, Symbolic scroll? Uh, it's a book, first and foremost, but uh, symbolic? You know, just check that real quick here. You know what, I need to minimize this thing. Um. Okay. Uh, oh wait, Matthew. I'm doing Matthew. That's for that's the wrong book. <laughs> Not thinking there. Um, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Who is worthy to open the book? The book. It's a book. Scroll. I uh, see they use new versions. So there you go. Let's continue. There are seven seals on the scroll, and each time a seal is removed, a prophetic event takes place. After all seven of the seals are removed, seven angels with seven trumpets are introduced, and one at a time, each angel blows their trumpet, and a new prophetic event takes place, until finally seven angels with seven bowls of wrath appear, and seven vials, but, you know, we're already beyond <laughs> lining up with the King James Bible. Let's continue. Even more events take place. There are a variety. So again, here the mistake that these people make is they say that the book of Revelation, the entire thing is chronological, and it's not. Revelation chapter 6 is the whole time of Jacob's trouble, beginning to end. And then it goes back and starts to give you more detail as the book of Revelation goes forward. But they don't get that. A variety of different viewpoints in pre-tribulationism as to the exact timing of the events that correspond to these seals, trumpets, and bowls. 
The main difference between pre-tribulationism and pre-wrath in this regard is that most pre-tribulationists believe that all the seals in Revelation chapter 6, as well as the trumpets and bowls found in later chapters, are events that take place during the day of the Lord's wrath. No, 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 no you lied again. The day of the Lord is at the very end. They're lying. Pre-wrathers believe the seven seals on the outside of this proverbial scroll are not the wrath of God, but rather only... He lets the uh, Antichrist, he unleashes the Antichrist with the first seal. That's not God's wrath. Okay. The contents of the scroll represented in the book by the trumpets and bowls are the day of the Lord's wrath. And so these seven seals are preconditions that need to be met before the scroll is opened. It is only after all seven seals are broken that the scroll can be opened and then the wrath of God unfolds. And this is exactly what we see in the flow of Revelation 6 through 8. Pre-wrathers point out that the events that take place during the seals are mostly things that are the direct result of the Antichrist's evil workings, not the result of God's wrath. For example, the first... So the Antichrist is not God's wrath. Yeah. The first seal is the introduction of the Antichrist as the rider on the white horse. The second seal is about the wars that the Antichrist will fight as he gains power. And who controls war? Hmm. Um, the Lord's up there just kind of going, oh, no, they, they started a war. I didn't know that. Crazy. Then, in the next two seals, you have famines and people being killed in large numbers, quote, with the sword. The fifth seal is an interesting one, and this is where many pre-wrathers begin their argument that these seals cannot be a part of God's wrath. The martyrs uh, that are the Uh-huh. See, here's where, how it works. Because the martyrs, they're dying, so God couldn't have caused that. Um, yes, he could have. And I've talked about that in one of my sermons. I forget which one it is. But it talks about the thing of that they're martyred, and they're saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge our blood on them which be upon the earth? And you say, well, see, God couldn't cause the death of the martyrs. Um, God could and God will, because these people that are going to be in that time frame are those that have rejected the gospel right now so the the saints in the time of jacob's trouble they're they're under a different setup than we are currently but see it's so hard for these people to imagine that but we'll go through this picked it uh in the revelation at um the fifth seal in my opinion is one of the strongest arguments for the pre-wrath position pre-tribulationists claim that the seals on the scroll, the seven sealed scroll, the seals are all of God's wrath. But that's contradicted by the fifth seal. In Revelation mm -hmm. 6 9, it says, Now when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the. How long, sovereign master? Holy and true. Sounds like some kind of Masonic title. What's that? Revelation. Uh, Six. See these these new versions. They mess with your head after a while. And you think, wait, what's the Bible say again? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, "How long, O Lord, holy and true? How long, Sovereign Master? O Lord, you know, boy, O Lord, sure is hard to understand. You have to update it to Sovereign Master. Okay." New versions are so ridiculous. The word of God, and because of the testimony they had given, they cried out with a loud voice, How long, sovereign master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a long white robe, and they were told to rest for a little longer until the full number was reached of both their fellow servants and their brothers who were going to be killed just as they have been. But they asked God, when are you going to start your wrath on the people on the earth who are responsible for our death? That is powerful, in my opinion, because to me, that explicitly 
declares that the wrath of God, that eschatological wrath has not begun. How long, O oh Lord, until you vindicate our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In other words, it hasn't been happening yet up to the fifth seal. And they're told okay, um, what about all the martyrs that died throughout church history? You know, what a lame argument. Hold, wait a little while uh, until the rest of your brethren uh, are killed. And then uh, the sixth seal is open and the great day of God's wrath has arrived. There are very few pre-trib responses to this issue. But one example is from Robert Thomas, who, though he doesn't say it directly, implies that what the martyrs were actually doing is crying out for God's wrath to finish. In other words, the martyrs are crying out for the end of God's wrath, not for God's wrath to begin. The problem, of course, is that the plain reading in both the Greek and English of this phrase, how long before you judge and avenge our blood, means that no judgment of any kind has begun at that point. No, This no, is reiterated no, 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 in the... No, no, no. <laughs> what? Uh, no judgment has come up to this point in time. Okay, first of all, let's stop the confusion here. Let's get the King James Bible. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay? The saints that die in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it's a time frame there. They missed the catching up of the body of Christ. And therefore now you have to prove your salvation. Oh, you want to be saved now? Okay, you're going to be beheaded. And by the way, um, why are they being killed? See, again, these people have no concept of this. Okay, they're being killed. Now, when does that get started? If you really want to make things, you know, get into this stuff and, and whatever else here. Uh, trying to think of where this is, you know, verse seven, Revelation 13, verse seven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay. Um, he's putting into, and he's putting them to death right in here. Um, Yeah, okay, I'm just trying to see if there's any others. But, you know, you get into the whole study of the book of Revelation. The Antichrist, when he's showing up and he's basically executing people, when the mark of the beast is being offered, take the mark or you get executed, which makes a real problem for these guys because they're saying, well, there's no judgment or there's no, you know, any kind of wrath or anything else um, until you hit the this time period here that they've been executed. Well, why are they being executed? You know, it's it's really bizarre. Let's continue. The next verse, when God tells them to wait a little while longer until the full number of Christian martyrs are killed. But uh, there are no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ is gone. Uh, how do you know that? Well, if you're new here, let me just explain something. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, verse 12, that ye should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. To when? Which is the inher inheritance, earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You are sealed until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, if a Christian can go into a time where they could take the mark of the beast, they would lose their salvation. It's so simple. So when you get people that go post-trib, they eventually have to say, well, there's no eternal security. You're not really sealed. The whole thing. It messes them all up. They will get into this whole thing. Let's continue. Both grammatically and contextually, God has not begun his judgment on the wicked at this point. Which is probably why we found so few pre. Oh, 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 come on here. God has not begun his judgment on the wicked up to this point. War, the Antichrist, you know, the Antichrist, war, uh, famine, death and hell. That's not a judgment on the wicked. 
you should be ashamed of yourself, you guys that are in this video here. Be trib commentators willing to try to explain this passage at all. This causes another problem for pre-tribbers, because if God's wrath has begun by this point, as they say, it would mean that these Christian martyrs in the fifth seal, they're not Christian martyrs, saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, had been going through God's wrath, which contradicts the doctrine that Christians will not go through the wrath of God derived from 1 Thessalonians. <sighs> Christians don't go through God's wrath. Saints in the time of Jacob's trouble do. So 5 verse 9 and other places, a doctrine that is agreed upon by all sides of this debate. God promises that that believers will not have to experience the wrath of God, the, the day of the Lord's wrath. And yet pre-tribulationists contradict themselves when they say that the fifth seal is God's wrath. You can't have both. pre -tribula Yes, you can if you understand dispensational theology, which you guys obviously have no clue about. There are no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ is gone. Proven by many scriptures, which I've preached for years. Tribulationists try to get around this by calling these Christians tribulation saints. They define tribulation saints as people left behind in the rapture who become Christians during the day Ugh. of the Lord. Ugh, people, they do not become Christians. They're saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. See, these guys are just lying. See, this is why I have to say, okay, there's a spirit here. It's not the Holy Spirit. They're not just confused. They're lying. Right here, they say that some of them call them tribulation saints. And then they say people left behind in the rapture who become Christians. No, they're called tribulation saints or saints in the time of Jacob's trouble would be more accurate. We don't ever call them Christians. So see, they're, they're misrepresenting the position right here, contradicting themselves and then saying, oh, oh it's, them that contradict. Oh, well, a common right. argument that I hear often is that, oh, well, the, these, they're, these, these believers, they're not, quote unquote, part of the church. Correct. Uh, they're, they're, quote unquote, tribulation saints. And the, they'll even go to the extent, not all of them, but some of them will actually say, you know, because they didn't accept Christ before the rapture, this is like a, a, cer a certain judgment on them. It is. I'm, I'm sorry, that's absurd. And it also, again, it contradicts what Paul says. In first it, it contradicts what Paul says. <laughs> Paul's writing to the church. <laughs> oh boy. In chapter five is that we are promised exemption from God's wrath. Writing to the body of Christ. Some pre-tribulationists, <sighs> Bill Salas for one, have proposed an entirely new theory which removes the fifth seal from the 70th week altogether. Salas places the first five seals before the seven-year period, which avoids the fifth seal martyr problem. <laughs> okay, and uh, I don't even know who Bill Salas is. Whatever. But this model is almost unheard of in pre-trib circles. While I many pre-tribbers argue about where to put the first three seals, and some pre-tribbers do, in fact, put the first three seals before the seven... What? Are we dealing with scripture here or so-and-so taught this or so-and-so taught that? Back to that again. When your period begins, placing the fourth and fifth seals before the seven years is fairly radical because they have such strong ties to the midpoint of the seven-year period. But it does have the one benefit of keeping these fifth seal martyrs out of the wrath of God and thus avoiding this major contradiction. The next bit of evidence to which pre-Rathers point to show that the wrath of God has not begun during the seals is the celestial disturbance sign found in the next seal, the sixth seal. This is the sign which Joel 2 verse 31 says will occur before the day of the Lord. So if this sign in the sun, moon, and stars in Revelation 6 is the same one that Joel talked about, then the day of the Lord cannot have begun by this point, because this sign happens before the day of the Lord begins. We see evidence that... Yeah, which the day of the Lord is at the very end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But see, they have it. They had to, to build up their little dummy, their straw man dummy, and say the day of the Lord is the entire seven-year 
you know, time of Jacob's trouble. They have to get rid of that term. They just call it the day of the Lord. So then they keep building off of that, digging in themselves even deeper into their heresies. That this cosmic disturbance sign in Revelation 6 is in fact the same one that announces the day of the Lord's wrath. Because as a result of people seeing this sign in the heavens, we see the following reaction. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Rev okay. Let me just check here. I want to see about something. Stupid new versions. They just I always hear new, these new versions and I think, what hold on, what? <laughs> okay. A little little jab at the Godhead here. I just noticed this and I thought, wait, that doesn't sound right. Okay, look at this right here. Uh Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their, plural, wrath has come and who can stand? What does the King James Bible say? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sat on the throne and from the Lamb, or from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his, singular, wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Uh-oh. New version there, lining up with the Satanic Trinity. Huh. Two different persons in heaven. Yeah, nice. Let's continue. Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17. Here again, a plain reading shows that the people of the earth believe that the wrath of God is about to begin at the. What, what do you mean the wrath of God is about to begin? There's two. That's why it's there. That's right, your two God Trinity. Sixth seal. Uh, the earth dwellers are diving into the rocks because it is now time for the day of recompense, for the day of <laughs> earth dwellers and then day of recompense. Okay. Uh, repaying the world for persecuting the people of God. In an attempt to deal with this damning evidence that the seals cannot be the wrath of God, pre-tribbers will typically argue about the tense form of the Greek word for has come. No, we won't. <laughs> in Revelation 6, verse 17. Many pre-tribbers say that since the phrase has come is in the Greek errorist tense form, it is in the past tense. In this case, they would prefer a translation such as the wrath of God has been occurring. Pre-tribulationists generally want to argue the day of the Lord began with the first seal. Uh, and no, 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 no. It begins at the very end. Okay, quit your lying. So when people say the great day of God's wrath has arrived, all they're doing is finally recognizing that they've been experiencing the great day of God's wrath. A growing number of Greek scholars strongly disagree with this idea pointing out that the reason any Greek word is rendered in the past, present, or future tense is determined by the context, not from Greek tense form. This can be seen by reviewing other instances in the Bible, including in Revelation 19 verse 7, where the errorist indicative tense form is clearly not supposed to be translated in the past tense. It says, the wedding of the Lamb has come, which is obviously not supposed to be translated the wedding of the I just check that quick. I need to make sure that the King James Bible's lining up with the aorist indicative. <laughs> uh, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Is come. They have has come. Yeah. Okay. Go back to using your little new versions and your the aorist indicative. <laughs> if you can use that in your in your normal speech this week. Let me know, and I'll give you a, send you a little gold star for your chart, okay? <laughs> Lamb has already come. Take the text at face value. Allow the text to speak. Okay, take the text at, at the face value. Oh, but you have to go to the 
Greek and talk about aorist indicative. <laughs> yeah. You see these these hirelings in these church buildings, they're such satanic little servants of the devil. They just contradict and lie all the time. Don't take it a text the text at face value. It's not at face value. You're a liar. You're a complete liar. You don't like the way this certain text do and whatever else. That you just will change it with the Greek. We'll go over to here. We'll twist it this way and twist it that way. We'll use a whole bunch of different versions to make it say what we want. The fact that the aorist is used more than 11 times in that sixth seal, uh, all of a sudden, just the one occurrence of it, though, it has such high and important significance, seems to me to betray the very system you're trying to build. Also, <laughs> consider the actions of the people in this verse. They are hiding themselves in the rocks because they saw the very same sign Joel said would herald the wrath of God. Yeah, it's at the end. These people didn't hide themselves during the first five seals. What has changed other than the celestial announcement that the wrath of God was about to begin? Another line of evidence for the pre-wrath position in Revelation 6. Uh, the wrath of God was about to begin? They just contradicted their own stuff with their own teaching and things. The vials of wrath, that comes before the, you know, the day of the Lord there at the end. Oh, man, it just gets it so mixed up. Comes from the recognition that the six seals line up perfectly with the teaching of Christ during his Olivet Discourse. Yeah, revelation 6 is a revelation to a lot of people when you start to compare it to Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. And this is a very key part of pre-wrath rapturism is actually something that was key to me exactly what i said last week all posties have to go with matthew 24 mark 13 luke 17 luke 21 and then make it the same they compare it with the book of revelation what's going on they say see it's the same so it must be for us and neither passage nothing in the gospels before the crucifixion and Nothing when you get into the time of Jacob's trouble in the book of Revelation. We are in between those time periods as the body of Christ. Can prove it. But let's continue. Really coming into the position, juxtaposing both the flow of Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6 shows a lot of parallels. The opening of the seals uh -huh. uh, is parallel to the uh, elements of. Uh, Jesus's discussion in Matthew 24. So uh, the rider on the white horse corresponds to the false Christs. Uh, the rider on the red horse is war. Uh, the black horse is famine. The, uh, the sickly horse is death. Uh, and then there's martyrs. The first three seals, uh, these are corresponded to Jesus's beginning birth pains. Uh, the fourth seal is correlated to the persecution of the Antichrist Great Tribulation. And the fifth seal is part of the Great Tribulation too, but it's showing the a result of the persecution, and that is martyrdom. That's why it was called the fifth seal, uh, martyrs. In case there is any doubt we are on the right track, the next thing mentioned after the persecution in Matthew 24 is the celestial disturbances sign in the sun, moon, and stars, which we now know means the day of the Lord is about to begin. We see this exact same sign in the sixth seal, which all but confirms that this parallel between Matthew and the seals in Revelation 6 is correct. Yes, it is. And every dispensational, Bible-believing Christian that believes in the time, catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, we would all agree with that. Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 are describing the same events, and the church isn't in them. There were no Christians in Matthew chapter 24. It was before Jesus died on the cross. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, Acts chapter 11. Right? The death of the testator begins the New Testament. Doctrinally, the Matthew 24 is in the Old Testament. Not that hard to figure out. The body of Christ leaves in Revelation chapter 4. They're there in Revelation chapter 5. And Revelation chapter 6 begins it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble with the arrival of the Antichrist. In the book of Revelation, in exactly the right location, as you're reading it sequentially, you'll find a 
clear. Uh, you're reading it sequentially. Uh oh, that's your problem. Clear discussion of something happening to the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is the clear identifier, indicator that God's wrath is about to commence. It is about to pour down on a wicked world. Now, the reason why this is so key is because in both the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation, we have this sign occurring. And that which occurs in the wake of this sign is an indication of deliverance. It is immediately after the distress of those days that Jesus appears in great power and glory and gathers his elect from the four winds. What so few people realize is that you can see the rapture directly after the sun, moon, and star sign in Revelation as well, though there is a kind of interlude after the sign and before the wrath of God. For example, the very next thing we see is an angel saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Then these angels go about sealing the 144,000 to protect them from the wrath that is about to come. Uh, you get this interlude in chapter 7. Uh, interlude? So God didn't hurt the earth in Revelation 6? Uh, the earth went totally unfazed when, you know, there was world war and the Antichrist and you know, peace is taken from the earth. Yeah, the earth wasn't hurt one bit. <laughs> okay. Famine, death and hell. All right. And it, the interlude is explicitly centered around protecting people from God's judgment. And so it says, be, hold on, before, don't let any wind blow on the trees and things like that. Um, but before any of that happens, we want you to seal the servants of God on their forehead. Directly after the 144,000 are sealed, we see the result of the rapture from the viewpoint of heaven. A great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7 verse 9b. We are given the final proof that the pre-wrath view of this timeline is correct a few verses later. Okay. Big problems. Okay. Number one, uh, you have Jews that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7, the first number of verses there, and then multitude after that that's sealed. Well, that can't be Christians. How do you know? Right here, Revelation 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. There wouldn't be a separation between saved Jews and Gentiles in heaven. We're all one in Christ. All right? That's problem number one. Problem number two with this thing. Oh, it's, it's Christians. It's Christians there. You know, they got raptured up after everything happened. Okay. Revelation 7, verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Show me one place in the Pauline epistles, written to Christians, that we're supposed to wash our robes. It's an element of work salvation, in other words. Hmm. Doesn't work too good, but that's so far above these guys' heads, they wouldn't understand it. Let's continue. When the angel tells John exactly who this group is, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, verse 14, b. Remember, the great tribulation is not a seven-year period. Theologically speaking, it's not. That's not great tribulation is not the term there, but it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's seven years. Yes, it is. Speaking, it is the persecution that begins just after the midpoint and extends until it is cut short by the rapture. This phrase out of the great tribulation then confirms the pre-wrath timeline. And it means that the day of the Lord will not begin until after the sixth seal. 
and that the rapture occurs at some point after the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel, and finally that the church will face the persecution of the Antichrist before the rapture. Okay, uh, what about John? Did John face the persecution of the Antichrist before the rapture? Uh, no. Uh, what about the 24 elders? Uh, no. Great multitude of angels round about the throne there? Uh, no. And again, what's the point? What would be the point? Forget all of the timeline and with this to here to there. What would be the point of the body of Christ having to face the persecution of the Antichrist? Why? Posties, please, please enlighten me with your brilliant scholarship. Um, why does the church have to be persecuted by the Antichrist in the end times? Do we have to wash our robes? Why? <laughs> it's the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel. The Jews require a sign. There's great signs in the heavens. Anybody there? The revelation of Jesus Christ to the church that already knows Jesus Christ. No, the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Jews that have rejected him as their Messiah. Jesus brings in the new covenant at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The new covenant is not here. The new covenant is not the New Testament. Again, watch my study on that. Another lie that these a lot of these guys will do. It's just so weird. I saw one of you mentioned earlier. It's this Catholic thing that they just shove the Jews out of the question. You know, the Jews just, you know, get them out of here. It's all about the church. We need to be persecuted. There's a depiction of the church's appearance in heaven, apparently as a means of protecting them from God's wrath, between the... Uh, where does it say the church appears in heaven in that passage there? I might say it in some new version from the Vatican. I don't know, but... Uh, King James Bible doesn't say that. Church appears in heaven. Doesn't say that. This is a lie. Open lie. The arrival of the great day of God's wrath and the actual execution of the great day of God's wrath. That's a pre-wrath rapture. Regarding this multitude in heaven, preachers would emphatically declare that this group is not the raptured church, but rather the so-called tribulation saints. But if you press them about why they must be tribulation saints and not the church, they will answer with a classic circular argument. They don't believe the church will be in the great tribulation, so this group can't be the church. There are um, it's not called the great tribulation. That's a lie. Right? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. There are, as far as I know, no other arguments for the existence of the tribulation saints view. You may be wondering why pre-tribulationists believe that the seals in Revelation 6 have to be a part of the day of the Lord's wrath, especially in light of all this evidence to the contrary. Do they have some proof text I'm not telling you about? Not really. The most common defense pre-tribulationists offer is that the seals are the wrath of God because Jesus opens them. This argument comes from Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, which says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its Book. seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. They argue... Okay, you ransomed people for God? What? I'm sorry to put everybody through this. <laughs> I did this as a, uh, you know, somebody requested it, but man, this is mind-numbing um and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book not the scroll and open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to god by thy blood okay redeemed us to god by thy blood redeemed how i love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb <laughs> all right uh you know, the redemption of the purchased possession. If you remember what I said, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Right there. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, are you to take the scroll and open it? You were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Ah, such confusion these satanic new virgins make. 
you, essentially, that since Jesus was the only one worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, the seals as well as the scroll must be judgment, since in other places in the Bible, Jesus is said to be the only one worthy to judge the world. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't logically follow that just because Jesus is the only one worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, that the seals on the scroll are judgment. This verse in Revelation 5 verse 9 would make just as much sense in the pre-wrath view in which the scroll's contents, not the seals of the scroll, are the actual judgment. This is often the sole argument from pre-tribulationists to prove that the seals are the wrath of God, and in my opinion, it's rather weak, especially when you compare it to the actual explicit biblical evidence we have seen here. And that brings us to something we have referenced many times in this film, but have yet to fully explain. The pre-trib doctrine of imminence. Ah, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, let me get my video here on this real quickly. Uh, God hath not given us a spirit of, you know, God is not the author of confusion. Uh, this watching this thing it, oh man <laughs> it's so bad uh, okay let me just get my video here I'll be back with you in just a second here. Okay. Right here, I have this thing that I did, the doctrine of imminence, where, uh, just to make it real clear, a lot of people came out and they said, oh, Brian Dominguez, now denounce, denouncing the pre-trib rapture. No, I'm not. I never have and I never will. Um. But what I'm saying is the thing of the doctrine of imminence, it came in in the 20th century as a way to get people, you know, you could come back at any time. You have to give, you know, don't bother holding on to your savings or anything else. Um, it could be any second now. And that was a big part of what I was saying in this study. I ticked a lot of people off with it. Standard, you know, for what I do. Um, they don't listen to what I'm actually saying. I do teach that there's that we don't know the day of the catching up. We have no idea. I don't know when. It's a mystery. It's not revealed in Scripture. This is when it's going to happen exactly 2,000 years from the time that Jesus went up, was ascended up. Or so. We don't know. Okay? We have no idea. What we're looking for as is as the time of Jacob's trouble gets closer and we're seeing it, you know, nearing, then, you know, at that point it will become imminent. But you can't make the argument that it could have happened at any time from the first century until the time of Jacob's trouble gets started. That's a stupid argument. And that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm going after in this study. So I deny the doctrine of imminence in, in terms of it could have happened at any time in 2000 years. That's ridiculous. Because if it had happened in 1400 AD, what would people have done from 1400 until 2000, whatever the year will be? Doesn't make any sense. So, and people have used this doctrine of imminence thing to basically not be real serious about, you know, serving the Lord in the end times and waging war against the Antichrist system, which we're supposed to hinder. He who now loveth will let until he be taken out of the way. Very serious type of a thing. So, um, just to get that out there, because they're going to say, you know, pre-trip believers, they believe in the doctrine of imminence that, you know, Jesus could come back at any time. We're going to show you a bunch of scriptures that prove that that's not true. Well, you're not really proving anything there because I don't believe in it either. So I put the thing there. Okay. All right. So let's continue. Imminence is really a keystone issue for the pre-tribulational rapture. 
Well, in the pre-tribulational theological sense of the term, eminence means that there are no prophesied events that must happen before the rapture. The rapture is signless. It can happen at any moment, right now. Uh, and hence, they consider the rapture imminent. It's hard to overemphasize how important this idea of imminence is to the concept of the pre-tribulational rapture. Pre-tribbers often claim that imminency and pre-tribulationism are basically one in the same thing. Take, for example, this quote from one of the most prominent pre-tribulational scholars, John Wolvert. For the most part, scriptural evidence for imminence today is equivalent to proof of the pre-tribulation viewpoint. For all practical purposes, abandonment of the pre-tribulational return of Christ is tantamount to abandonment of the hope of his imminent return. The first thing that you should know about imminence is that it is a brand new doctrine. It appears to have originated in the early 1800s with the so-called Plymouth Brethren and John Darby, and there is no sign of the belief in an imminent rapture before the Antichrist arrives among any of the church fathers of the previous 1800 years before Darby. Okay, there are quotes from church fathers about the body of Christ being called out before this final time there and whatever else, but I could care less what the church fathers say. We're dealing with scripture. I'm a Bible believer. I don't care what the, the church fathers said. Again, we're going to kind of a Catholic sounding thing here, but don't get into that. And it's not just pre-trib critics saying that. Even pre-tribulationists agree that it cannot be found in the writings of the early church. Take, for example, Dr. Larry Crutchfield, an expert in church history and a pre-tribulationist. He spent a huge amount of time looking for evidence of imminence in the early church writings and concluded his paper on the subject like this. While there are in the writings of the early fathers seeds from which the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture could be developed, it is difficult to find in them an unequivocal statement of the type of imminency usually believed in by pre-tribulationists. We do not say that the early fathers were pre-tribulationists in the modern sense, only that the seeds were indeed there. Earlier in the paper, Crutchfield said that what the early church did believe about the timing of the rapture should be termed something like imminent intra-tribulationism, meaning that most of the church fathers believed that the rapture would only come after the Antichrist was revealed and the persecution of Christians began. Who cares what the church fathers believe? The same church fathers that are venerated by the Catholic Church. And uh, by the way, the early Christians, their writings were burned by the Catholic Church. So what did they actually believe? We have no idea. Why do we need them? We have the Bible. Duh. Believed the rapture would be imminent, but only after the certain precursors occurred, most notably the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. This pre-tribulational expert on the church fathers, therefore, is essentially telling his readers that the early church was for all intents and purposes pre-wrath. We will deal more with the early church in the last section of this film, but for now we will go through all the ways pre-tribbers will try to prove imminence from the Bible alone. If you take all the verses that pre-tribulationists use to prove imminence, a few patterns emerge so we have categorized each proof text in its own group. The first group I will call waiting for verses. This includes verses like Titus 2 verse 13, which says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or Philippians 3 verse 20, which says, But our citizenship is in... Yeah. Okay, enough of the, your new satanic new versions there looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. And the, you know, people will say, well, Paul was looking for, no, he's prophesying future events. there. Okay. I've covered this all in my study, the doctrine of eminence right there, covered it all. So. In heaven and from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see another example of this type of proof text in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7. But the basic idea is that believers should wait for and be expectant of Christ's return. There is no technical reason to believe that these verses are speaking of imminence. 
In other words, you can do a word study in Greek with the terms for waiting for or await, and you will find that these words do not mean that no events will occur before something or another takes place. Uh, oh, man. These guys are something else, I'll tell you what. Um, first of all, there are multiple prophecies on, in the Pauline epistles talking about the last days, that we're going to see certain things. Perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know, it, there's a whole bunch of different things listed in the Pauline epistles. So anybody that teaches that there are no signs that predate the rapture, you know, the catching up of the body of Christ, that's not true. Okay. So again, they're making a lot of problems, but this whole thing of, well, we can, if you do a word study in the Greek, what is the Greek? See, does the Greek mean imminence? Which text, which edition? How are you defining these Greek words? What lexicon are you using? They never tell that to people. They just make you think that there is only one Greek text and only one way to interpret it, which is nonsense. Let's continue. Or that something could happen at any moment. They mean pretty much what they mean in English that you are just waiting for something. In the case of this waiting for group of proof texts, a pre-tribulationist would say that if you are eagerly waiting for the rapture, then the rapture must be able to happen at any moment. But it should be obvious that that doesn't logically follow. You can eagerly await all kinds of things that are not imminent. You can eagerly await Christmas, but it doesn't mean Christmas can occur at any moment. You can eagerly await a wedding, but it doesn't mean that the wedding will happen at any moment. You can see a biblical example that imminence is not the logical conclusion of eagerly awaiting something in 2 Peter 3 verse 13, where it says, But according to his promise, we are waiting for, pras dakao, new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Apostle Peter says that we are to watch for and to expect the new heavens and new earth. But we know, and even pre-tribulationists would admit. Okay, let's look it up in the King James Bible, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Um, waiting for? It uh, doesn't say waiting. <sighs> you see? You see why Satan created these new versions? Let's see. This is why we use the King James Bible alone. Just look for the new version to prove your point. Well, see, it says waiting in this Second Peter 3.13. Like that's definitive or something. Which version? I mean, they're not even telling you which version right there. There are certain prophesied events that have to happen before the new heavens and the new earth. So if to watch means imminence, that then they would have to admit that the new heavens and the new earth are imminent events, which, of course, they would not admit. What the Bible is saying is that we should, as Christians, look forward to, wait for, and eagerly anticipate all the wonderful things that God has in store for us, including his return, so we can begin our eternal life and be with him. But to be expectant of something is obviously not the same thing as thinking it will happen at any moment. The next group of proof texts for imminence could be called Be Good Because Jesus is Returning. This is probably the largest group of pre-trib proof texts for imminence which consists of verses like 1 John 2, verse 28, which says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Shrink or Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. <laughs> You're really in a problem now there, partner, going to Hebrews chapter 10. No. Which says, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are a few more verses like this that are basically saying the same thing, that Christians should strive to live moral lives, to do good works, and that they should live those moral lives because Jesus is returning. 
The argument pre-tribbers would make here is that because the New Testament writers are telling people to be morally blameless because of Jesus' return, it must mean that his return could happen at any moment without signs. In other Again, if you follow this ministry, if you've been studying the Word of God for a while, I mean, just looking at this, you think, what in the world? It's not even about the body of Christ. About a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews, you know, there's neither Jew nor or Greek in the body of Christ. We're all one. Why is a book written to Hebrews? And all the doctrinal stuff that teaches in the book of Hebrews, that if you take the mark, basically, you deny the Lord. You're going to lose your salvation. Talked about that many times. It's written for the, a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble, not for us today. In other words, according to pre-tribbers, the New Testament writers were telling people that they should keep doing good, because if they don't, they could get caught doing something bad, because Jesus could return at any moment and surprise them while they were sinning. Pre-tribbers have taken this concept very seriously and have even developed a doctrine about sanctification which uses this idea as its base. That is, that the fear of being caught in the act of sinning from an imminent rapture keeps Christians on the straight and narrow path. Pre-tribulational teacher John MacArthur claims that our very sanctification depends on imminence. He says, quote, The hope of Christ's imminent return is therefore the hinge on which a proper understanding of sanctification turns. Yeah, John MacArthur that says that you can somebody could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. John MacArthur that denies the blood. Uh, John MacArthur that writes his own version of the Bible. Yeah, and all the other things I exposed about him. He's a heretic, works salvationist. This position really does not accurately reflect how the scriptures declare we are to seek to live godly in Christ Jesus. I live the Christian life because I love God. The fact that his son is coming for me is added benefit. But not knowing when he's going to come does not demure my desire to live holy at all. You better have more motivation than merely the fear that Jesus is going to come back uh, to lead uh, a life of, of, of um, committed discipleship. Uh, if, if that's your only reason for, for, uh, for being committed to Christ or submitting to his lordship, then you've got a deficient view of discipleship. The submitting to his lordship? Hmm. Lordship salvation? Oh, yeah, maybe. Question is, though, is there a better explanation for why the Bible says that Christians should do good works because of Christ's return? The answer is resoundingly yes. In fact, these verses which pre-tribbers think are about imminence are really just a few more examples of one of the most prominent themes in the New Testament, which is that Christians should live godly lives in light of the fact that they have been given eternal life. Let's turn back to 2 Peter 3 to show how this works. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him. This verse shows us that the reason we are told to live godly lives is not because of an imminent rapture, or anything at all to do with being surprised by something unexpected. Rather, the point Peter is making is that the new heavens and new earth are a picture of the eternal life that a believer is promised. That is why we should live godly lives, because of the joy of our inheritance, because of the sureness of our resurrection to eternal life. When you look at the other so-called proof texts in this group, it becomes clear that the same theme here in Second Peter is in view, and that the only reason those verses even mention the rapture is because the rapture is the very picture of eternal life. It's the moment believers become immortal. But the point is exactly the same. 
Let me show you a few more verses where it says the same thing in the supposed imminence proof text, except the rapture is replaced with eternal life. So we can be sure this is less about the event of the rapture, but more about what the rapture represents, i.e., our eternal life. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Galatians 6. If we do not give up. Uh, use the King James Bible. I'm just trying to get through this. I don't know if I should even just skip this whole thing here and go to the next one. Um, because it's really no argument here. Um, I'm, I want to try to get through this stupid thing today, so I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, you know, I don't believe in imminence. Like I said, I've taught it, taught it here. Um, it's not imminent until you get closer to the time of Jacob's trouble, then we don't know when it's going to be. It will be imminent at that point in time. But they're using a false argument to try to prove that it's not true and all this other stuff. So um, I'm just going to skip ahead. Yeah, we'll just go ahead to this one here. If you really want to go back and watch the rest of the thing there that I'm skipping, whatever. But uh, it, they're not proving anything, so let's continue. The church and Israel problem. One of the foundational arguments for the pre-tribulational rapture is concerning the relationship between national Israel and the church. It's based on Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, where we find the so-called 70 weeks prophecy. This prophecy is where we get the con What do you mean so-called? It's pretty plain to me. Concept of a future seven-year period in which the majority of the end times events take place. This prophecy in Daniel is about the future of Israel. The weeks, as in the 70 weeks prophecy, are understood to mean groups of seven years. So 70 weeks would be 70 groups of seven years, which works out to 490 years. In Daniel, these 70 weeks are divided, with the first 69 weeks having been fulfilled in the past, and the final week, the final seven-year period, still awaiting fulfillment in the future. And during the gap between the first 69 weeks and the final week, there has been something like 2,000 years and counting. This gap of time that we are currently in is commonly referred to as the Church Age. Most of the proponents of the various rapture positions we have mentioned in this film, like pre-trib, post-trib, and pre-wrath, all agree on the basics of this prophecy, that there is a future seven-year period in which the end times events will primarily play out and that the seven-year period will culminate with God fulfilling His promises to national Israel. I think the scriptures are very clear that God uh, has a future for Israel and that that future is going to be uh, culminated in the millennial reign of Christ on earth after His return. Pre-tribulationists, however, have proposed a unique interpretation of this prophecy which supports their view of the rapture. The theory is that God does not work with Israel and the church at the same time. They insist that a hard distinction must be made here. Uh, uh, no. God works with the church only? No. No. Okay, there are Jews that are getting saved. Weird. Let's continue. God has completely and totally paused his dealings with national Israel during the church age. Pre-wrath takes... Okay, let me just, you know, go over that real quickly here. They're lying again to prove their point. They, these guys are, have a real problem with lying. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That goes down through there. Um, there's a remnant that gets saved. Okay? Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace god is still dealing with the jewish people jew can get saved so they're lying here let's continue but it, you know in terms of israel as a nation being god's chosen nation right now no they're not he's bringing them back in unbelief like the bible said would happen to their land 
there's a lot of fake Jews over there, and I think God's eliminating eliminating a lot of them, but they're being brought back for the time of Jacob's trouble. Takes a similar view, with the difference being that pre-wrath teaches that God has only relatively postponed his dealings with Israel during this church age, not absolutely, and that God can and has worked with both the church and Israel during the church age. <laughs> a bunch of liars. That's what the Bible teaches, but pre-tribbers don't believe that. And that he will continue to do so in the final seven-year period. Ah, I see how that works. See how that works. Isn't that nice? So God's dealing with Israel and the church, and he will continue to do so in the future. Ha, 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 yes. Nice. Uh, no, actually, we're neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ. So there's no Israel right now in terms of there are Jews that get saved, but then they're part of the church. But when you get here, there's a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. The reason pre-tribbers are so insistent that God will absolutely not work with the church and Israel at the same time is because they use that particular idea in one of their arguments for the pre-trib rapture, which is that since the 70 weeks prophecy was made to Israel and is about Israel, and since the time between those two sections of the 70 weeks is the church age, they say that when the clock starts on this prophecy again, it will be all about Israel. And so the church must be raptured before it begins. Mm -hmm. They'll say that God doesn't work with. That's probably why the word church, you know, is gone and by Revelation 4 and doesn't show up again till much later. It's not there in the whole time of Jacob's trouble. And they probably will not go to. I'll, I haven't watched this yet, but more than likely they will not go to the, you know, Jeremiah chapter 30, where it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. They won't talk about that. We'll see if they do. Put Israel in the church at the same time. Israel is going to be part of the seven-year period. Therefore, the church cannot be part of the seven-year period. The assumption is that uh, God cannot deal with Israel and the church at the same time. And so since Daniel's 70th week uh, was part of God's dealing with Israel, the church must not be uh, on earth when uh, Daniel's 70th week begins. Let's start with their premise that because this 70 weeks prophecy was made to and concerning Israel, that the church will not have any part in its fulfillment. One great way to show the complete inconsistency of pre-tribulational thinking here is by turning to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, where we see a prophecy that in many ways is just like the 70 weeks prophecy. For example, it was explicitly given to Israel and was concerning only Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And, like the 70 weeks prophecy, it was given at a time when the church didn't even exist. But in this case, nearly every Christian agrees that this prophecy applies to the church as well, as it is talking about the new covenant instituted by Christ. And <laughs> See how they did it again. The new covenant and the New Testament are the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. The new covenant has not come in yet. Oh, what a bunch of liars. The New Testament was brought in by Jesus Christ. That's why you use a King James Bible. It says New Testament. The new covenant did not come in yet. In which the Spirit of God will dwell within the hearts of men and change them from the inside out. Before I show more evidence that this idea is wrong, I would like you to notice that this critical doctrine among pre-tribulationists, that God does not, will not, work with Israel and the church at the same time, has no actual proof text like other doctrines do. It is merely an assumption among pre-tribulationists, and worse, it's an assumption that they routinely abandon when it suits them. Take, for example, the so-called tribulation saints idea. Whenever a pre-tribber reads in the Bible about Christians existing within the last seven years, where does it say Christians? Doesn't. Period, which is a very frequent occurrence, they call those people tribulation saints, people of various nationalities left behind after the rapture who become Christians. Well, if they don't become Christians, stop lying. If God won't work with the church and Israel at the same time, how do they explain these tribulation saints? Are they not saved? How do they explain the tribulation saints? 
I thought you said they were Christians. Do they not have the Holy Spirit? Are the Gentile believers among them not the church? Is God not working with them because he won't work with them and the Jews at the same time? To drive the nail in the coffin of this unbiblical doctrine that God won't work with Israel and the church at the same time, let me simply show you lots of places where the Bible says God works with both groups in the past, in the present, and in the future. In the past. God worked with Israel during the church age in A.D. 70, before the death and resurrection of Jesus, during the Old Covenant dispensation. A prophecy was given to Israel concerning God judging Israel with the temple's destruction. Jesus, on a number of occasions, he prophesied the judgment on Israel. When did that happen? In AD 70. God is also working with both the church and Israel at the same time in the present, in at least two ways. The first is that God... AD 70 is after Jesus died and was buried and resurrected. The New Testament was in in AD 70. What? Huh? Okay. God is making Israel jealous and saving a remnant of Jews during the church age. Paul, why do we have to put the text crooked like that? Put in the... <sighs> Looking forward to this thing being done. This is insane. Ugh. cites the following prophecy about God making Israel jealous through extending his salvation to the Gentiles. But again I ask, didn't Israel understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation. With a senseless nation I will provoke you to anger. And Isaiah is even bold enough to say, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became well known to those who did not ask for me. Paul responds to Moses' and Isaiah's prophecies, exclaiming God's faithfulness to his promise to Israel. I ask then, they did not stumble into an irrevocable fall, did they? Absolutely not. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to make Israel jealous. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. God is using the salvation of Gentiles as a means to provoke Israel to come to salvation. And he is in fact saving a remnant through those means at this time. Uh -huh. If we look at the last 2,000 years plus, God has been dealing with Israel and the church at the same time time. The, the church defined as the assembly of the Lord of both. A uh, little correction there just to be straight. Uh, there is no Israel before 1948. Okay. 80, 70 or so, whatever else, Israel fell as a nation and they were gone for the entire time up until 1948. So the Jews there would be the correct way to say it, but there, there's so many errors and things with this. I mean, it, it just these new versions just cause so much confusion. It's insane. These guys are so just far off the deep end. I just we'll finish it here. Jew and Gentile, God has the gospel going out, and He is gathering the constituents of His kingdom, and He has been doing that. But Israel is still His chosen nation, still His people. They are still under discipline. There still is a remnant being saved. The other way God is working with Israel in the present age is by God regathering Israel back to their homeland. A key aspect to this would be the monumental event of the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. God has been and continues to this day providentially regathering Jews to their homeland Israel. The prophet Ezekiel prophesied that this would happen in his dry bones prophecy in Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. It's fulfilled. These are the dry bones. Of course, the flesh, the flesh part of the prophecy has not been fulfilled. That's going to be the spiritual regeneration of Israel that will happen at the end of the seven year period. But the dry bones part of the Ezekiel prophecy, by the way, Ezekiel's prophecy was made to Israel, but it's 
Okay, take a break here for a minute. Wasn't the KJV made by from a Catholic? My friend said that. No, um, what is taught there is uh, Erasmus was a Catholic scholar, and he helped to compile what later became known as the Textus Receptus. But the Catholic Church rejected his work, um, and the Textus Receptus was used as the primary Greek text that underlied the King James Bible. But it, the Textus Receptus came from the Orthodox system, not from Roman Catholicism. And like I said, the Catholic Church rejected Erasmus's text, and they never used it. So the King James Bible was not purely from the Receptus either, by the way, I might add that. So whoever your friend was there said that, that's not true. It was 54 Protestant scholars that translated the King James Bible over the course of seven years. By the time it was done, it was 47. So just to add that in here, the break from the insane lying of this video. Let's finish up this part being fulfilled during the church age in the future this next one cuts to the very core of the matter since if you can show that god in the future works with both israel and the church specifically during the final seven-year period you have refuted the very foundation of this odd doctrine and while there are many ways to show this there is one in particular that i like the best and it is found in revelation 12 which says but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, verses 12 to 17. Here we have a picture of events squarely within the last seven-year period, and yet we read that after the dragon becomes furious at his inability to get to the representative of Israel, i.e., the woman, he then goes after the church, i.e., those that hold to the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> oh boy, I got a real good one there. These are the same, it's two things that they're having to do. Okay, keeping the commandments and these new versions, stupid satanic new versions. Uh, let me go to the actual word of God, the holy word of God. Um, okay, what verse? Oh, that's right at the end there. Okay. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war the remnant of her seed, the seed of the woman. The church is not the seed of the woman, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not this satanic nonsense right here. But the rest of her offspring, who on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Hold to the testimony? Uh, yeah, no. Um, let me show you another verse of scripture on that. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. They have to do two things, in other words. Here is the patience of the saints, not the church. All right. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's what it's talking about in Revelation chapter 12. But these pathetic morons in this video will not show you that. See, here you have the Jews keeping the commandments, and here you have the church. <laughs> Isn't that a nice little system they have worked out? That's the church there. It doesn't say church, but we know it's the church. It's Christian church. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, both groups are obviously on earth at the same time, and obviously during the final week of Daniel, because of the reference to the last three and a half years in verse 14. So it follows that God is in fact working with both groups at the same time, in the end times as well. God works with Israel and the church at the same time in the past and in the present. So it shouldn't be surprising that the church will also. Uh, you didn't show any in the past. Okay. You lied. You said 70 AD. That's not the past. That's in the church age. Okay. In the present. Yes. Israel can be saved. Okay. Any, uh, Israel, I should say. Jews can be saved and they're part of the body of Christ. And they don't, it's not Jews and 
the church or something in the future. This whole thing is just such nonsense, but let's get through it. So enter into, with Israel, this future seven-year period, the Antichrist is going to go after both groups, not just Israel, but Israel and the church during the Great Tribulation. Well, I do agree. These guys are going to be going into it. But that's not because they're part of the church, part of the Catholic Church or Satanic Church. I'm not sure which. Okay, almost done. Let's get through it. Keep your... Uh, Barf bag close by if you need to. Now we're going to get into the early church problem, and we're going to talk about John Nelson Darby and the fact that none of the early church fathers said it. And there was one quote here, and he did say it, but he's actually talking about some other thing, and it didn't really mean that. And whatever. We'll just kind of go through this one. I'll see how it goes. It's about the scriptures. What do the scriptures teach? Uh, here we go. The last preacher problem that we will cover in this film concerns patristics, which is a name for the study of the writings and beliefs of the early church. Ooh. The writings from the early church fathers date back to the first century. And of course, we should never take their writings as proof of one doctrine over another. The Bible is always the ultimate source for our doctrine. What is the Bible? Singular reference before a singular word, the Bible. They don't believe any such thing. They've demonstrated that all through this stupid documentary. They quote, they quote multiple new versions, and when they show the King James Bible, they make fun of it. These are servants of hell that put this thing together. But at the same time, most, if not all, of the doctrines we hold today were taught at some point by the early church fathers. At the very least, these writings provide insight into what the earliest Christians believed about certain subjects, whether those beliefs were right or wrong. So the big question is, what did the early church believe about the timing of the rapture? And in one sense, the answer to that question is pretty simple. Every single early church father who taught on the relationship between the church and the Antichrist believed that the church would face the Antichrist before Jesus returns. The belief that Christ was going to return after Antichrist had done damage to the body. That believers had suffered and had been under his uh, rampage and that they would be set free from that by the appearing of Christ in the sky. That is the basic sequence. And you'll see that in the writings of the fathers. You'll see that in, uh, say, the Didache. Uh, as we kind Didache. of look at their collected writings, in the dedicate. <laughs> they believed in uh, oh, the man. truth that the church was going to encounter the Antichrist and that the coming of Christ was going to occur in the wake of their encountering of the Antichrist. It's not just pre-Rathers that think this either. Pre-Trib scholars would by and large agree with what was just said. I mentioned in the section of this film about imminence a paper written by a pre-tribulational early church expert named Larry Crutchfield, in which he concluded that while he couldn't find any evidence of pre-tribulationism in the early church, he did find what he called intra-tribulationism, by which he meant people who believed they would be raptured out of the middle of the persecution of the Antichrist, which is essentially pre-wrath. In another paper written more recently, essentially pre-wrath, <laughs> Um, no, actually, the first book that I know of that's in print on the pre-wrath rapture right here said that it's a new position on page 265. Page 265, right there. I read it in the first part. You can see that. It's a new position. And remember, uh, oh, we have these writings of the early church fathers. Why did they survive? Why would the Catholic Church keep those writings and burn the writings of other uh, <clears throat> heretics? Yeah. James Stitzinger, who is very much a pre-tribulationist, agrees with Crutchfield's conclusion when he wrote, The early fathers largely held to a period of persecution that would be ongoing when the return of the Lord takes place, and most would see the Church suffering through some portion of the tribulation period. He further writes, a type of imminent intra-tribulationism, Crutchfield, 
or imminent post-tribulationism, Walverd, with occasional pre-tribulational inferences, was believed. In this paper, he... Okay, um, at this point in time, I'm just wasting people's time, right? I think most of you would agree with this. I could care less what the early church fathers taught. Um, they're, they were preserved by the Catholic Church. Who cares? What does the Bible teach? You didn't prove anything from the King James Bible. In this whole stupid documentary, you set up false argument after false argument. It's This is one of the worst documentaries I've ever seen. So we'll go here to the outro thing because I'm just not going to waste any time. What the early church fathers said and who said this and John Nelson Darby. It's not the standards of Bible-believing Christians. What do the scriptures say? We search the scriptures to see if these things are so. All right, so here we go. Let's finish up. If you liked this film, please consider sharing it with your friends and family. <laughs> it is by far... Uh, don't worry, I won't be sharing it with my friends and family. We watched it as the body of Christ here, and we thought it was ridiculous. Far the best way to help get the message out. We are counting on the small percentage of you that understood and were impacted by this film to reach those that you feel need to hear this message. This film is free on the web, but you can buy physical copies at our website, 7 pretribproblemscom where we will provide free resources, videos, and much more content to learn about the pre-wrath rapture. Thanks for watching. Should get down through here and maybe maybe later on and say, you know, um, yeah, here, unless, unless otherwise indicated, all scripture quotations are from the ESV. You know, there's all the little special things and whatnot, but it should say, you know, made possible in part by you know papists or the Jesuits or something like that. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, um, I'll go back here to the beginning where we got started. Okay, I'll just leave it there. So, uh, uh, that is rough to get through. I mean, some of this stuff, it just gets so confusing and just all jumbled around and everything else and they lie and lie and lie oh mind numbing so we'll do some questions and answers now um ugh. i mean last one i did was bad and this one here is just kind of yeah all right so Anybody has a question, just write question first and then your question after it. Question, did you ever preach on the dispensation of time past, but now ages to come as found in Ephesians chapter 2? No, I haven't. That's a good question, actually. Um, you're taking certain things and, and whatever out of uh, the passage there. I know what you're saying. Um, I don't think I ever have done anything on that so does anybody else have any other questions have you heard of Jordan Riley real talk no I have not What are your thoughts on what happened at the UN General Assembly recently about the two-state solution? I have not heard anything about that. Um, question. I am a new widow with no body of Christ members near me. How important is it for me to find believers near me for spiritual covering? Um, what area, I'm not sure what area are you in. Um, it's it's a really big problem right now for the body of Christ because we're so separated and so spread out and everything else. It, it, it's a really tough thing. I mean, we're kind of up here in the middle of nowhere in northern Maine. 
Um, but something to definitely pray about. If you want to write where you're at, just, you know, the area, not your actual street address or something, I can post that up. And if anybody's in your area, they can contact you. Um, it's good to have fellowship with the brethren, definitely. Uh, when you did a study and mentioned natural flavors was aborted baby tissue, where did you find that this information? I could find nothing at the time, but there's more information now about this. Um, I don't know if I said natural flavors or aborted baby tissue. Natural flavors are another name for um, MSG. Um, vaccines have uh, viruses that are cultured off of aborted baby tissue. Um, I heard, I think, that somebody said that natural flavors are aborted baby tissue. And I, I might have said, oh, really, I didn't know that or something. But I don't have any kind of proof saying that, just to be clear on that. Um, could you please look into the three and a half interpretation of the time of Jacob's trouble? There's a short scripture only video called Unlocking Daniel's 70th Week, the Great Tribulation, which I can't refute. Um, I think Brian Donovan came out with some things on that. Um, I don't know. I'd have to check into it again. It's been a while since I heard that. Um, it's a problem for me because you see the body of Christ in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. So it's kind of a weird thing there. Um, What's your opinion on delivering DoorDash as a side hustle, given that most of, a, of what I deliver is fast food and soda? That stuff is bad for a person. Um, you can technically make arguments for almost anything. I know what you're saying. If, if Lord's convicting you, you know, um, and saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, okay, then try to find something that you can replace it with. How about teaching on how, on who Jesus really was, I guess? Um, okay, I think I've kind of mentioned some of that um, stuff there before. I'm trying to catch up here. How do you explain Revelation seven fourteen more specifically? There are they; these are the they which came out of great tribulation. Um, those are the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble that come out of it. That's why there's a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. Yeah. In Psalm 1, what is the law in verse 2? It's basically a reference to the Word of God, I would say. And, you know, you could make it the Ten Commandments as well, because if you actually follow the Ten Commandments, it's a good thing. You know, not for your salvation, but as just following it. Um, could you do an in-depth study on birth control? I left a comment on your abortion is murder study. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I will think about that. I know that there's some uh, some of the toxic stuff that they put into birth control is really, really insane. Um, I'd like to do a study on that. I'll, I will definitely write it down and uh, think about that. Are you going to write a book on the pagan church buildings? I hope you will, brother. I would love to, but it's just a matter of time right now. Um, we have a lot going um, on. Um, I'm trying to answer a quote-unquote contradiction in the Bible. It's regarding King Ahaziah. He reigned when he was 22 or 42. What was there? To King Ahaziah's, I haven't been able to find the answer. I think Ruckman mentioned that in his book. Um, uh, where do I have it? About the errors in the King James Bible. It used to be called the problem text or something like that. I have it, but the uh, Bible Baptist Bookstore has it. I'm, oh, there it is. Yeah, right here. Trying to find it. Right there. It's in this book right here. Um, I should probably do a video on that or something. But um, there's an explanation for it, certainly. Uh, new to your channel, have you covered the Noahide laws? No, I have not. Um, something I would need to do some study on before I could really talk about that. Um, Natural flavorings is aborted baby tissue. I heard it from Dr. Scott Johnson. 
I, I have not done enough research. I have heard rumors of it and whatever, but I have not done enough research that I can confirm that. Um, I'd have to see his proof and things. Question, why does Jesus, his half-brother Jude, in his letter in verse 14 through 15, quote, Book of Enoch, chapter 1, uh, word for word, but the church says Enoch is evil. Don't read it. Um, he doesn't quote the book of Enoch. Okay. Let me just explain that. Jude. Um, 14 through 15. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And he to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him um there is no book of enoch okay in terms of in the bible he's just saying enoch prophesied god revealed this to him that enoch prophesied he's not saying in the book of enoch so what a bunch of gnostics did later on is they came along took that quotation there and then said we'll put this into a book that we write and we'll call it the book of Enoch so that you think that there is a book of Enoch that's mentioned in scripture when there isn't. Do Jacob's trouble saints ever become part of the body of Christ or Old Testament saints? Are they now part of the body of Christ? If not, can they lose salvation? Um, they're not part of the body of Christ. Only Christians today are part of the body of Christ. Um, again, that's a pretty big study. I can't get into all of it, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, yes, they can lose their salvation. Absolutely. You take the mark, you worship the beast in his image, you lose your salvation. Um, will you be doing any new off-grid stuff? I posted videos on the forum. Chantre knows about it. Um, I don't know right now. I don't have any real serious plans or anything right now. Um, you mentioned before children under the age of accountability will be raptured up. I know you said it was your opinion, but in the Old Testament, many times children are slain and not saved. Um, where does it say that children are saint, slain and not saved? Um, in John 6, 39 through 40 and 44, 54, Jesus says he will raise believers on the last day. And in John 12, 48, Jesus says he will judge unbelievers on the last day. Where's the seven years and the 1,000 years? Um, I'd have to do some more study on that one. Um, but I'm sorry, my brain, I get done with these, especially watching some video like that, and it's just kind of a, <laughs> but makes my brain all messed up. Um, but, uh, you know, the day of the Lord is a 1,000 years. So I would say that the, Great way throwing judgment is where the lost get judged. And, um, you know, Revelation chapter 20. So, yeah, I, I can't just answer some of this stuff. It would take a whole sermon to answer it. Um, are you going to turn that large study on the bread and the word into a book? I would like to sometime. But, uh, again, it's just a matter of time here. Uh, is a big issue. Okay. Do you believe that Jesus being at the temple age 12 marks the age of knowing right from wrong? Well, I have no idea We're dealing with the Lord there versus people. Um, Question, can a real Christian have ever been a nurse or doctor even before COVID without compromising and without getting fired? A lot of nurses say they're Christian and see nothing wrong for a job. Um, that's another thing. It's very debatable. Um, when you are there and you're actually prescribing these drugs and you're seeing people getting sicker and all the other stuff, it, it it's real difficult to be a Christian in that system. Um, really difficult. 
So, okay, well, I'm going to end it here. Um, hopefully people haven't been too confused by all this stuff. Um, again, you know, I've preached for many years on the issue of the catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, these guys don't even get close to answering, you know, a lot of the stuff that I brought out over the years. Um, so don't be deceived by this type of a thing here. It's um, just a bunch of nonsense. So, all right. So, okay, we could go over some more stuff, but my brain's <laughs> going on this whole thing. I want to try to, I have to get, there's three more studies I need to do. I had notes for, and um, was, was going to do them today at our out, outdoors at our property. But the problem is we have a bunch of things to do. We had a lot of wind um, here, I guess, two days ago, or no, yesterday. And we have uh, one of these like shelter logic things or portable shel shelters, and it just totally ripped the roof of that, the tarp that's over the top of it. So I have to fix that today. Um, apples to pick, um, more work to do around here and things. So, um, so that is going to be it, <laughs> I guess. Uh, this this video here was just confusing. Um, anything anybody wants to send me in the future, if it's not King James Bible, I'm not even going to waste time on it um, because it just it leads to a serious spirit of confusion. So um, I guess that's going to be it, and we will see you in the next video. And as always, thank you for watching. So we'll see everybody later.